when I was a kid, I hated getting my hair cut. Um, I did like going to the barber shop, though. I liked it because of the mirrors. So remember how the old-fashioned barber shops look? The walls in the shop in front of the chairs were just solid mirror. And the wall behind it was solid mirror, too. And so if you were sitting facing straight into the mirror, it was no big deal. You just kind of see your face looking back at you. But if the chair turned just a little bit, then everything would change. And so I'd see my face in, in the mirror in front of me, and the mirror behind me was reflecting my face back. And that went back and forth, reflections of reflections of reflections, literally into infinity. And I guess eventually they got so small that you couldn't see them anymore. But everything was reflected like that. The barber, my dad, the next chair over, and all of that. There's actually uh, a couple of names for that. One of them is the barbershop effect. And you'll see artists and architects use this idea in what they call an, an infinity mirror. But it amazed me. I thought it was beautiful. There was something really profound and kind of trippy about it. And I said something to the barber once about how cool it was, and he acted like he had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> and he and my dad exchanged one of those, there's something wrong with that boy looks. <laughs> And so I didn't bring it up again. But it made me wonder if there are not a whole lot of things like that, things that we see that are amazing, but we get used to them. You see them every day. We get jaded. We lose the ability really to be aware of them and aware of how, how interesting they are. So I want you to do something for me. Can you kind of see the sky uh, we're behind me, sort of up through there? There's a sky. Um, it, we, when, when we get done here, you can try this outside if you want to. But um, for now, imagine that you can look up past the tree branches at the sky and even past whatever clouds there are, there's a few of them up there, to the great blue beyond. And imagine that up there, beyond the clouds, there's a big net. And the net extends across the entire sky. And then even beyond it, past the horizon, past where you can see. Got the idea? So there's an ancient Indian myth in which Indra, the king of the gods, asked an architect to create something, an adornment of some kind that would inspire everyone who saw it. And so the architect created this vast net which he hung above and Indra's palace, up in the sky, up in the heavens over the palace. And it stretched out from that point over the palace infinitely, infinitely in every direction span the entire sky and then beyond it, beyond anything you could see, infinitely everywhere. And then at each point on the net were two strands joined. The architect attached a precious jewel. And as the net extends infinitely in, any, in every direction, there is an infinite number of glittering diamond-like jewels. And each jewel is cut in such a way that it reflects all the jewels around it. And like the mirrors in the barbershop, it reflects the jewels and the reflections in the jewels on and on. So it's infinitely times infinite times infinite times infinite. So not just an infinite number of jewels, but an infinite number of reflections of reflections. So you should feel a little bit awestruck by this idea by now. So... Now think about this, if you do one thing that affects one jewel, or just a few jewels, pluck one of the strands on the web so that it vibrates, what happens? In a net, every strand of the web connects directly or indirectly with every other strand. So if you tug on one jewel, the entire web and all of its countless jewels also change. There's no way to affect one part of the net without affecting everything else again and again, over and over, infinitely, through this limitless entirety. So this image of Indra's net appears in a Buddhist scripture called the Flower Garland Sutra. And it's used in that sutra as a metaphor for oneness, the principle that everything is connected to and interdependent with and reflects everything. Everything is within and part of a whole, and the whole is contained within everything contained in the whole. So we may feel isolated and apart from one another sometimes, but we are really one with all existence.
And this can seem kind of abstract, but if you look carefully at life, you begin to see the connectedness. And because everything reflects everything else, we and our world are infinitely interdependent. So there was a Chinese monk named Fa Zhang. Fa Zhang. He was the third patriarch of the Huayan school of Buddhism. That's a Chinese term that means flower garland. And without going into a lot of complicated explanation, Fa Zhang and this school of thought gave a lot of importance to the nature of reality and to how you resolve concepts of like emptiness with concepts like eternality of the Buddha and Buddha nature and things like that. And so his conclusions and ways of working with these ideas had a lot of influence on the evolution of Mahayana Buddhism, especially Chan, which is the Chinese foundation for Zen. So you don't need to remember any of that. Fa Zhang was a very creative Dharma teacher who found interesting ways to illustrate some of these principles. And one of his key patrons was Empress Wu. Empress Wu was notable, among other things, for being the only female monarch in the history of China. Um, she ruled officially <clears throat> from 690 to 705, uh, but she had already ruled through her husband, we know how that works, and then through her sons. And so she had sort of unofficially been the ruler of China for about 40 years altogether. And Fa Zhang had a very unique way of demonstrating to Empress Wu the principle of interconnectedness as illustrated by Indra's net. I want to do this one of these days. He had a room built that was very remarkable. It was square, but he had mirrors on all four walls and in each corner and on the floor and on the ceiling. And then in the center of the room, right about there, he placed a Buddha statue with a lamp next to it. And so the Empress would go into this room and no matter where she looked, she saw not only the Buddha statue reflected in the mirror, but also all the other mirrors. So no matter where she faced, she saw each reflection and all of its iterations. So this infinite reflection of reflections of reflections. And what was especially interesting about that room is that wherever you look, you see the particular, the, the singular object as it appears within the whole. And each individual mirror contains and reflects everything else. So this kind of expresses an interesting understanding of reality in its different forms. And Fa Zhang and that school of Buddhism is at least partly responsible for the idea that emptiness is equivalent to the concept of oneness. So let me explain that a little bit. So basically there's this attribute of existence called emptiness, which says that nothing has an inherent, permanent, discrete, separate self. So conventionally we think we have a self and we tend to think of that as sort of a thing, separate from other things, which also have some sort of inherent selfness. But the Buddha saw, Buddha saw that what we think of as a self is really a compound of other compounds. So things that come out of the air and the water, the ground, and so on. Along with ideas, perceptions, feelings, and awareness. And none of those things are really specifically ours since we're exchanging them constantly with the environment around them. It's really kind of easy to feel that when you're someplace like this. And you can see that you're breathing the oxygen created by the trees. And in turn, they're taking in your carbon dioxide. And so we get this sense of being a part of something in this really kind of tangible way. And all of those things are affected by everything else. And since everything is constantly changing and everything is affected by everything, then like the jewels on Indra's net, we all reflect and are in turn reflected by everything else in the universe. So this is interesting, but where does it stop being an amusing intellectual exercise and become something that we can live? And one of my favorite teachers, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, Bhikkhu, says something interesting about this. He said, we can measure our wisdom by the extent to which we can get ourselves to do things we don't like to do, but that we know will lead to happiness. Uh, and, and to the extent that we can refrain from doing things that we want to do, but that we know will lead to harm. So let's see if we can follow that train of thought and see if this can help us do that. So um, 
in essence, interdependence says that for one thing to be, something else has to be. And like I said, it's easy to see this out here. Without the oxygen, there's no me. Without the trees, there's no oxygen. Without the light, there's no trees. Without the sun, there's no light. And we can go through the process with the earth and the rain and everything. And so if you follow this train far enough, if you pull this string long far enough and unravel it far enough, what you find is that uh, remove any one thing and nothing else is here. So follow those reflections from jewel to jewel to jewel far enough and eventually you see that the interconnections are so extensive that probably if you didn't exist, I wouldn't either. Everything is ultimately that interdependent. So this is also where oneness comes in then. We realize when we look carefully at what we think is myself that there's no real actual separation between myself and all the other selves. And if we take that far enough, we can use that really to transcend much of the suffering that we experience. Because much of the suffering we experience comes from the idea that I'm me and I'm not everything else. There's a famous teaching on emptiness that says that when the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, who's the sort of saint of compassion, realized emptiness, that that was enlightenment. So knowing emptiness, he was freed from fear, freed from stress that arises to clinging from things that are ultimately empty. So armed with the wisdom of emptiness and oneness, we can transcend a lot of our difficulties. We can realize our Buddha nature, which is just our true nature, our true purpose. Your Buddha nature is your authentic self, free from clinging to ideas like self. So the problem with Indra's net is that we are looking at it from inside it. And so it's hard to see how brilliant it is if you're identifying with one of the jewels in it and, and not seeing the others as being related. So we get to be kind of like the barber who no longer sees how amazing the mirrors are. Zen Master Dogen had an interesting comment on this in an, in an essay where he really kind of laid out what Zen was about. He said, when you ride a boat and you watch the shore, it looks like the shore is moving. But if you can keep your eyes closely on the boat, you see that the boat moves. And similarly, if you examine myriad things, everything, with a confused body and mind, you might suppose that your mind and self are permanent. But when you practice intimately and return to where you are, it's clear that nothing at all has an unchanging self. In other words, when you look clearly, when you become still enough to see the entire net of existence and not just your own place in it, you start to see the whole. And then he adds something that has become like the classic of, of Zen teachings. He said, to study the way of enlightenment is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things. And when that happens, your body and mind and the body and mind of others drop away. So you can experience that just by kind of forgetting yourself as you immerse yourself in your purpose and what you're doing. Musicians experience this all the time when suddenly they'll say, you know, I feel like the music is playing me. And if you've ever done something that you just really love doing, that you can really fully engage in, you'll forget yourself for a little while and you get into this kind of flow of experience. So let's come back to Earth, down here in this beautiful place, this beautiful garden. When you pay attention to the natural world, you start seeing connections between things. The way the leaf connects to the twig, the branch to the trunk, and so on. You spend a day just noticing how the world, the natural world and otherwise, is put together. You start to recognize that not much happens without the connections between things. If you look close enough, you find that pretty much everything is a connection. So our spiritual practice is such a connector. It can connect our intention to our actions. Without something like mindfulness, for instance, even the best of intentions don't go anywhere. It's like having a car, but without the lug bolts to hold the wheel, wheels on. It could be a great car, but you're going to have a real tough time getting anywhere in it. And so sometimes in my tradition, we'll talk about 
our spiritual practice is the way of oneness. We acknowledge our oneness with all beings and our sense of community with all life. And it's not just we're all one community or whatever. This is true and this is a good thing too, but it goes beyond that. We're part of a whole and the whole is reflected in us. Just like Empress Wu's Buddha statue reflected in each mirror, which in turn reflects the entirety. So what one, uh, there, there's a psychologist named Ronald Nakasone who, who talks about this in terms of kind of the ethics of how we live and he put it really well. He said, what affects one member of the community affects me. What I do in turn affects every other link in the web. Tug one strand and the whole web vibrates. Since we're all inextricably bound together in a community, what affects one link affects everyone. The idea of an interdependent universe means that the dignity of all humanity rises and falls with individual actions. That's kind of the important thing in this, that the dignity of all humanity rises and falls with our individual actions. So ultimately we come to understand the universe as an expression of the karma of a universal goodwill that labels, labors unceasingly to lead all beings to spiritual peace. I like that term karma of universal goodwill. We can see karma working in kind of universal ways that are not always based on goodwill. But this idea is present in all the world's major religions in one way or another. It doesn't mean just going around feeling groovy all the time. It means acting in the world in a way that is loving. So once you begin to see yourself as an instrument of that karma of universal goodwill, then a natural extension of that would be to let your compassion manifest in social action. And the Buddha was kind of a, an activist. He encouraged others to practice both for their own benefit and for the benefit of others. And he pointed out that to protect one's own virtue, in other words, to, to um, your ability to, to make good, strong, ethical, and moral decisions, is to protect others. And so he equated non-harming as an act of generosity. In refraining from doing harm, you give freedom from danger, from animosity, and from oppression. And in giving this gift, he gains a share in limitless freedom from danger, animosity, and oppression. I have a friend, old friend, who posted something on Facebook earlier this week. He said that he keeps having this dream that he wins the lottery, and he wins lots and lots of money, and then he spends the next day going around giving everybody he knows a million dollars. And then he wakes up and he realizes it was just a dream and he's very sad. And so I messaged him and I said, well, just be nice to everybody. <laughs> because one act of kindness, you never know, one act of kindness could be worth a million bucks to somebody. And if we got to experience the results of all of our kindness, you know, think about, Think about what the world would look like if, if all of your kind acts and their results came back to you in some tangible way. What would that look like? It would probably be pretty beautiful when you think about how it compounds and this jewel vibrates that jewel and that jewel and it's all reflected back to you. That would be pretty beautiful. So Dogen said all sentient beings are aspects of enlightenment. Great enlightenment right at this moment is not self, not other. It's not always easy to see this because some sentient beings out there seem like they're anything but awake. And sometimes our awareness of them shows up first as anger and things like that. But if I practice with this idea that I'm not separate from others, then my actions will arise out of a place of love and compassion. And then hopefully when I do take action, I'll take loving action. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'll close with the benediction. Moment by moment, may we re realize we all walk on the same earth. Moment by moment, may we remember that we are one under the blue sky. May we appreciate each moment and the connections between them. And may we recognize each one as sacred. We surround all beings with the infinite light of wisdom and compassion. Particularly, we send loving thoughts to those in our community who could not join us today, to all beings living in ignorance and to all who are seeking truth. 
May penetrating light dispel the darkness of ignorance. Let all karma be resolved and the mind flower bloom in eternal spring. May our efforts here today recognize all spiritual teachers of this community and may their vows be fully realized. We pray for the health and well-being of those suffering from diseases of body, mind, or spirit, those ministering to the sick, those grieving for loved ones lost, and those comforting those who mourn. We pray for those suffering from violence and those who grieve for them, for those living in oppression, for all who are imprisoned, and for all refugees from hunger, war, and catastrophe. May they be serene through all their troubles, and may we ascend to the throne of peace and realize the enlightened way together. Even that mosquito. <laughs>